prophet, Deuteronomy. They talked about a prophet would come. And then we see in uh, Acts chapter 3, they talked about Jesus being a prophet. They also talked about in Psalms, Jesus being a priest. And we see that talked about in Hebrews, where he is a prophet and a priest. Talked about his death in Isaiah 53, 12. His resurrection in Psalm and Isaiah. He was the cornerstone, the stone that the builders just tossed away. He is the very cornerstone of the church. Talked about that in Isaiah and then in Peter. He was going to the Gentiles. Isaiah, Isaiah talked a lot about this. He had a lot going on prophesying about Jesus Christ. In Psalms, he talked about Jesus would be the head of the government. And then we see that in John, and then, of course, in Revelation. And then he would be king. So Jesus is a prophet, he's a priest, and then he's also a king. And not just a king, the king of kings. And Psalms predicted that. David, when he wrote that psalm, predicted that. And we see that in Luke and John fulfilled. He but had universal dominion in Psalms and in Daniel. Universe, think about that universal dominion. Who on this earth has actually had universal dominion over the whole earth? Who has it? Nobody yet. How many people have tried? A lot of people have tried that, but Jesus will have universal dominion. Paul wrote about that in Philippians. Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess. And Paul said, whether they're on the earth, underneath the earth, above the earth, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means Satan is going to have to bow down one day, and I'm sure he's not going to do it willingly, to say and admit, probably through gritted teeth, Jesus Christ is Lord. He has to admit it because it's a fact. All the demons will have to bow down and admit and testify to the point that Jesus is Lord. And then, and this is a good one, not only will he have universal dominion, how long is that going to last? Two terms? Eight years? How long is his universal dominion going to be? What? <coughs> Say it again. Forever. Which is a long time, right? Forever. That's how long it's going to be. But hope realized. All these people prophesied this, and the people of Israel got to see this. But there are two people in particular that got to see this happen. Remember the story? Joseph, Mary, went to Bethlehem because they were having... They were, they were making the tax rolls, making sure that they had everybody registered. So they went to Bethlehem. Mary gave birth to Jesus there in Bethlehem. And then Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day, just like the Jewish males are supposed to be. And then they went to the temple in Jerusalem to give an offering for the male child, which is specified in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy. So they went there to do that. Now, Mary and Joseph were not, uh, as you could say, extravagantly rich. And so there was an offering that you could do. You could offer either a lamb or you could offer to turtle doves. And so that's the offering that Mary and Joseph gave because they did not have a lot of money. But there were two people at the temple that day. Now, it wasn't a coincidence. They were there often. One man was named Simeon. Now he was a prophet in Israel. And God had spoken to him and said, Before you die, you will see the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Messiah. Simeon was there. He saw this young couple with a baby come in. Actually, Simeon said the Spirit, the Holy Spirit came on him, led him to the temple, led him straight to where Mary Joseph and Jesus were in the temple. And he took Jesus and he said, God has fulfilled his promise. I have seen the Messiah, the hope of Israel. I can go to my death in peace. He saw hope fulfilled that day. 
And then there was another person there. Her name was Anna. Now she was a prophetess. She was at the temple all the time. She had been married for seven years. And then it says, the Bible says, now people debate on this, whether she was 84 years of age at the time this happened, or she had been a widow for 84 years. Married seven years, husband died, and maybe a widow for 84 years. But she, was, she spent her time at the temple, fasting, praying, worshiping. And she came up to this scene, and she knew that this was the Messiah, and she was able to see and hold Jesus. Isn't that kind of interesting? You get to hold Jesus? I mean, he was a baby, right? Right? Because you get to hold babies. That's what people want to do is hold babies. Except when they're crying a lot, doing all that. And here, I'm getting back. But, you know, you want to hold babies. And so, Simeon and Anna got to actually see with their own eyes and hold with their own hands the Messiah, the hope of Israel, and the hope for the Lord. Hope. Confident expectation. Now, hope is always dynamic. It's always active, direct, and life-sustaining. It's never static, never passive. Hope is always there. The active results of hope are those who truly have a biblical hope and live accordingly. God will always come through for us no matter what, but we have to let Him do it. And that's hard sometimes, isn't it? To let God, to step back and let God just, okay, you got it. You got it. Is that hard to do or what? What are we taught, taught to be in our society? We're taught to be self-sustaining, aren't we? We, we? we can handle it. We got it. I got this. I don't, I don't need any help. I don't want any help. I've got this. But we have to let God do it. So what do we need to do? We need to learn to trust Christ and His promises no matter what we feel, no matter what others say, and no matter what the circumstances. And we can find ourselves in some very tough circumstances at times, but we need to let God take it. Don't, you know, it's hard when you're standing in the middle of a circumstance. It can be overwhelming, but we have to continue to look to God. And He is taking care of it, even when it looks like nothing's happening. He's taking care of it. Now, God's helped other, helped other people, and that should be an encouragement to us, that if He's helped other people, He will help us. And we shouldn't be selfish in our prayers, God just help me, but we should be praying for other people too. To give them that hope. And it doesn't, now, this is an interesting thing I wrote down. It does not mean that God always must rescue His people from danger or heal every affliction, but it does mean that He holds the ultimate authority. And that we need, we do not need to fear. Somebody told me one time, I checked it out, 365 times in the Bible, fear not. Fear not. Somebody said, well, isn't that nice? But fear not for every day of the year. One for every day. Fear not. Fear not. How many times do we approach things in our lives with fear? Fear can be debilitating. It can paralyze us. We've seen that happen out in the bush. When we've seen predators hunting, and basically what happens is when the predator sees their prey and they lock eyes with it, that animal all of a sudden fear and they stop, and that's it. Because then the predators got them. Because out of fear, they just stopped. They were paralyzed, and then it was too late. But Paul wrote something for us in Romans. He told us we are more than conquerors. You ever thought about that? We are more than conquerors. We are more than just winners. We can overcome things because God has made us even more than a conqueror. And the words of Jesus should give us hope and comfort in every situation. What are some of the things Jesus said? My peace I give to you. My peace I comfort you with. It's not the peace that the world talks about, but it's the mind which is an all-encompassing peace. And then he also said, well, I'll stay with you part of the time, and then you got it. Is that what Jesus said? <coughs> Jesus said, I am with you at three quarters of the time. What did he say? Always. I am with you all the time. All the time. 
even if you don't feel it or feel like it, He's with us all the time. And then, in John chapter 11, He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever believes and lives in me will never, never, ever die. Now he's talking about that in an eternal sense. We pass from this life to the other. We die, but we go into a life of eternal dwelling with Jesus Christ. Someone asked me one time, they said, how do we know that Christians go to heaven? How can we know that? How can we know for sure? Well, in John chapter 17, remember we talked about that a few weeks ago, that was the prayer that Jesus prayed. And he said in verse 24, he said, Father, I desire those you have given me to be with me where I am, that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. Jesus prayed for us that we would be with him and that we would see his glory. And so, what's the basis there? In 1 Thessalonians chapter, uh, let's see, chapter 5, if I haven't lost it, it says, for God, now this is, we can know this because Jesus, he prayed that prayer, but he paid the price for us. In 1 Thessalonians 5, he said, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake, alive, or asleep, dead, we will live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you were already doing. So, the price that Jesus paid for us is the first part of it. The second thing, He said in John chapter 14, how many times have you heard these words at a funeral? Your heart must not be troubled, or let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you also believe in me. In my Father's houses are many mansions or dwelling places. If not, I would not have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. So Jesus paid a price, and then he said, all right, this is the promise that wherever I am, you're going to be with me. And then, the verse that I read first, the prayer that Jesus prayed, Father, I desire those you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they will see my glory which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundations. That's his prayer. And you know what? God always, always, always answer Jesus' prayer. Always. And so that's how we can know that we'll go to heaven because the price that Jesus prayed, the promise that he gave us, and the prayer that he prayed. And that's the hope that we have here on earth at this point in time that Jesus Christ is taking care of us and we can give that hope and share that hope with other people. Remember the song? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. What is it? All other ground is sinking sand. That's right. That's the hope that we have. The prophets gave us the prophecies. The people of Israel, many people believed, many more did not. But the prophecies came through through Jesus Christ. Every word they said about him is true, and it came to pass. And we can live in that hope today that Jesus said, because of the price he paid, the promise that he made to us, and the prayer that he prayed, that we can have that promise and hope of eternal life. Remember what I said hope is? <clears throat> Confident expectation. I know sometimes, how many of y'all, when you're at Christmas, boy, I hope I get a bicycle. Or I hope I get that slingshot. Or I hope I get that Red Rider BB gun. Yeah, which you'll shoot your eye out with, right? All right. I 
only watch that movie once, okay? Just once. But, and I almost bought a Red Ryder BB gun the other day. You can't believe I only watched it once. But anyway, you know, you have that hope. Boy, I hope I get this. I hope I get that. I hope this happens. But you're, you're kind of guessing and speculating. But here, the hope we have in Jesus Christ is confident expectation. Because everything he said will come to pass. Everything. The price he paid, the promise he made, and the prayer that he prayed, that's the hope that we have, and we need to share that hope with others. Let's bow our heads, please. <coughs> Do you have that hope today? It's nice that uh, you had prophets that would talk about different things and let us know we really believe those things. Remember 1972 when the Northwoods Mall was built? It was a lady who made a prophecy that the Sears, the building that Sears was in, would fall within a year. It's still there for us. So that person really didn't have a leg to stand on, so to speak. Didn't, didn't get it right. But we do because of Jesus Christ and who He is and what He's done for us. Do you have that hope of eternal life? Basing it in Jesus Christ alone. If you don't, I'd like to share with you how you can have that peace and that hope. And if you do, as we're here, Advent, the first Sunday, basically Advent means coming. Why don't you thank God right now for the hope that you have in Him. And you can have the hope which is confident expectation that He's taking care of those things. No matter what's happening in our lives, He's taking care of it. Even though it doesn't look that way, He's there. Father, well, we thank you so much for this time. Advent, and we can look Jesus to your coming. And not only the first time, but we are certainly looking forward to you coming again. And you promised that too. And you are coming again. We don't know when, but we know it will happen. <coughs> Help us all to be ready. Thank you for the hope that you give us. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. <coughs> Maybe you'd like to come forward just to pray, or you can pray at your seat, whatever you like. You can like to come talk to me about knowing Jesus as your Savior. I'd love to talk to you about that, but this is your time. Just do respond in any way that you choose.